Welcome to the She's Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hi there. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the She's Bold Podcast. Today's conversation is with Katie Arnold. Katie is a contributing editor at Outside Magazine, where she writes the column called Raising Rippers, and that's about bringing up adventurous kids. She's also written for the New York Times, Men's Journal, ESPN, Mary Claire, Runner's World, Elle, and Sunset. Katie is also a very accomplished ultra runner, having won the very difficult Leadville 100 run, as well as a host of other long distance races. She's a wife, she's a mother of two, and she has a new book out called Running Home. In this conversation, we talk about how she manages to juggle her personal life with her work life and her running life and what she's had to give up to do so. Katie, as you might imagine from someone who's accomplished in many things, has a very positive outlook on life. And as such, she takes care in the type of language she uses. And as you'll hear, uh, she talks about uh, how she had to work with her doctors to overcome her injury and the language that she and they used around this. Katie is super focused and super dedicated to the things that are important to her. And it's really no wonder why she's so successful as a long distance runner. Before we get into that conversation, a quick reminder to please tell your friends about the She's Bold podcast. Word of mouth is the number one way that a podcast audience grows. And without your help, I would not be here bringing you these fantastic conversations. Also, please make sure you're subscribed and take a moment to give it a quick rating or review. All of these help with the ranking of the show, which helps it get more visibility, which ultimately means the messages in these episodes find their way to more people. You can support the show on Patreon by going to she's boldpodcast.com slash Patreon. You'll notice there's no advertising on this podcast. That's because I rely on supporters like you to help me pay the podcast bills. Podcasts are free, and I believe they should remain that way. But if you find value in these conversations, I'd be ever so grateful if you'd show your support. Becoming a supporter gets you access to bonus content, which takes the form of an additional question I ask the guest. In Katie's case, I ask what the strangest place was that she did a workout. Again, this bonus content is only for Patreon supporters. And really, you can support the show for as little as a buck a month. Finally, I'm working on another Ask Me Anything episode. If you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode, send me an email at beth at she's bold podcast.com or leave a message at 877-280-5170. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Katie Arnold. So I bought my first pair of uh, true trail running shoes last night. What'd you <laughs> and get? I'm so excited. Ultras. Okay, great. Um, I'm a zero drop gal, and that's really kind of what fit best for me, I felt like. Do you have a favorite, favorite um, brand? You know, I, I was zero drop for a while, and um, just lots of strain on my calf after too much, so I'm about a four drop. But so, I did the whole barefoot thing. I did the Vibram. Yeah. And did you do that with ultras or did you just do No, with I was shorter doing that runs. just shorter. Yeah. And then when I realized that I was fast, it's harder to run fast in those Vibrams because mm. there's just a lot of ground feel. Mm -hmm. And so I went, I think my happy place is a four millimeter. I run in Hoka's and just got an amazing pair of the new Nike Kygers which feel like little springs under my feet. Now, the Hoka's, I think the misconception is that there is there's more lift or more drop, more drop there's with not. those. No, there's just more cushion. Yeah, that's interesting because mm -hmm. I thought I got uh, kind of schooled. I went to the running event. Have you ever been to that mm -hmm. in Austin? I went to the running event last December and talked to the guys there. And they're like, oh, yeah, because I run in Pearl Azumi's mm -hmm. and Pearl Azumi's getting out of the running business. Yeah. So I stocked up on a bunch of them and I'm just starting to run out of mm -hmm. my running shoes now. So anyway, well, good to know. I'll check out I'll check out some Hoka's. They're so. great. And I find that anything over like 12, 14 miles, I kind of like that extra cushion. Okay. But ultras, I, I like, I mean, people love ultras. They just, they didn't work in my feet, but mm -hmm. they're wider, wider. They are. There's box. a bigger mm -hmm. toe box. Yeah. On mm -hmm. it. So we'll see. I'm going to, I'm going to. That's exciting. Test though. them out. It is exciting. Cause it's, I'm, I'm not a trail runner. Oh, I'm so just, you do road. 
I do all road. Oh, wow. Yeah, I do all road. I think I've been on a trail once wow. and it was probably four miles. And then I've got, I've got about 125 plus miles coming up in September that I have to do in five days in Hawaii <laughs> on well, trail. So I've yeah, got to, I have to train myself. Trail time. See, that's my happy place because it's easier on my body, the grade and the the surface just moderates your speed. It's a very natural. So you're never, you know, you're not pounding the same way for any, you know, every step is different and mm -hmm. the contours and the, and the technicality of the trail is all so exciting. I the think. thing that scares me about it though, is that I know that it's exhausting, like on your quads and your calves, right? Well, if you have climbing, yeah, if it's steep, but if it's flat, then it's not, I think it's less for, I mean, I think it's more forgiving. But on isn't it kind of rare that it's flat, that a trail run is going to be flat? Well, I mean, this run I did in Portland at the amazing forest park at um, Wildwood is, I would call it flat, but mm -hmm. I live in the mountains, but it's rolling. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think that you just, you know, do some strength training. Your quads will get up to speed ASAP. Oh, do you think? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because I'm so nervous about being so exhausted that I'm going to be tripping over no. rocks. Just do, and... you know, I do lots of, I'll stop in the middle of the trail and do 100 squats. I do lunges. You can just be really, you know, I spend two days, a, two days a week, I go to the gym for an hour and do a lot of quads, but you'll get strong. You don't even need to because you'll get strong by doing, by trail running. How long have you been trail? I know you've been running since you were seven. Mm -hmm. How long have you been trail running? I've been trail running probably since I moved to New Mexico, so for almost 25 years. Wow. And have you had coaching during that time or has it, is it pretty much you're just out there figuring it out? I'm just figuring it out. I'm pretty much self-taught, self-coached, had a coach for a short window and it was helpful. I had, my kids were younger. And so sometimes it's nice to just wake up and be told what to do. I'm a very good, if someone's telling me what to do, if I believe in what they're doing, I follow it. You know, I'm also a little bit of a rebel on the side. So, but I, I like that. It took some of the guesswork out, but ultimately I decided that I knew my body best and I was willing to coach myself and it's much um, better. It's I'm an intuitive runner. So I am always listening to my body. And if it feels like a structured training plan, I will rebel against it. And so it needs to feel creative, expressive and fun and intuitive. So coming from within rather than, I mean, there's so many great training plans you can get on the internet. But when I first started running ultras, I knew that I would, I wanted to figure it out myself. And that's just the nature of my personality. I think most people fall back on a coach like they do going to the gym. It's like, if you're paying for it, then you're going to do it mm -hmm. because the training plan is Maybe. there. I never thought of it that way. I thought of it more like, I don't want to overtrain. So my, the coach was helpful in saying, hey, you need to take a rest day, but Ultimately, I felt that I could be, you know, a, a good coach for myself. Which means that you're self-motivated. Very. Yeah. I don't lack in motivation yeah. or discipline. Where did that come from? Just always had it. I think being, you know, taking it way back to sort of the, the armchair psychologist, but like, you know, my parents split when I was young and um, it's just trying to get approval you know, and my parents were both, you know, school was very important to them and doing well and, um, you know, being a good athlete. They wouldn't have ever said that, but that was a way to get their thumbs up. And so I've just always had that, like, you know, go, I'd come home from school, do my homework first and then go out to play. But I was a big player. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, that was super important. I just learned to do the work first and then get out and play hard. Mm -hmm. So work hard, play hard, I think has always been my mantra. Did you play team sports? Yeah, I did. I played lacrosse was a big sport for me back east in New Jersey and tennis. Ah, and I was on the swim team as well. Not that was more for fitness. I wasn't very fast, but I do love the water. How did you find running if see I'm not a team sports person I love being by myself I have three brothers three older seven nine and 11 years older and so by the time I you know came of age 11 12 years old they were out of the house so I spent a lot of time by myself and I enjoy that and it's really kind of that's where I'm most comfortable mm -hmm. you know to be honest and so team sports aren't my thing. So when I go out for a run, I resist. I understand kind of that rebel thing in terms mm -hmm. of a coach. 
but I kind of resist running with other people because I don't want to be on somebody else's Well, I'm very much that same way. And so I think that, you know, in in my book, Running Home, it looks at those sort of those contradictory things in life that are, you know, we're not one or the other. We're often both. And, you know, we're not just scared, right? Because in the book, there's a chapter where I'm attacked on the trails. And so we're not just afraid all the time, but we're also meeting the fear every day. So I had both at the same time. So in answer to your question about team sports versus individual, I'm really both. And I crave the quiet time on the trail. I don't really run with other people. That's partly because I need the time away and in my own thoughts and non-thoughts. I mean, it's a non-thinking state, which is so liberating. Why I think so many people run is because we move to that place beyond thought. But I also, you know, run alone just logistically, like it's easier than planning around other people. But for me, running is very much a creative act. And so it's a way that I write. So I've been a writer for as long as I've been a runner since I was seven. Mm -hmm. And um, when I run, I am in a sort of waking daydream state, kind of a meditative state where... So you're not listening to anything. I sometimes listen, but I still can be into in that creative space when I'm listening. Music actually puts me into that space. Music's really powerful for me. And I grew up in a musical family. And so... Um, I'm writing as I'm running, not literally, you know, like Dean Carnassus, the ultra runner who is in the book and who I met and was formative in my becoming an ultra runner. He actually wrote his book while like he dictated it while running. For me, it was more organic. I would get ideas. I would see patterns to things. I would see how stories fit together in that way. I was, I write when I run and I've done that for as long as I've been a writer and a journalist at outside magazine. So started running at seven. Mm -hmm. Were you doing distances when you were that young or what, what, what drew you into that? Well, in the book, as, as you'll find out, I became a runner by accident. It was my dad's idea. And, um, he was not an athlete. He was an adventurer and a national geographic photographer who was on assignment. And, um, you know, his way of being in the world was, to go exploring. And so he loved nature. He loved taking us outside. We did bike trips and raft trips and, or river trips. And, but we were visiting him when I was seven and he just had this idea and he had funny idea. Like he, he would throw this things out as a lark, kind of not really thinking we would say yes. And again, you know, in that, whatever that psychology of, of being a child and trying to get your father's attention or approval, I said, yes. And the idea was to run a 10 K race. And, um, he was not a runner. He didn't have ambitions for me to be a runner. I mean, it wasn't like parenting now, which is, you know, that helicopter parent or the parent who orchestrates every move of the child's life. He just threw it out. And, um, I said, yes. So my sister and I ran this race and, you know, in the book, I write about that experience of sort of just how bumbling we were jogging, limping, staggering for six miles to the finish. And I'm sure we finished last and I'm sure we cried and, you know, we're tortured by it. But when I crossed the finish line, I felt that runner's high that it's about the journey and not where you finish in the end, but it's about the process of getting there and realizing you're stronger than you think you are. And this was at seven? I was seven. And you realized that Mm -hmm. back there and you you remember it. I felt that feeling of like, I just did this thing that seemed really hard and I got to the end and I did it and I wanted to feel that more. And so I became a runner that day, but not in the way that I went out and raced or got competitive or signed up for all those teams at all. You know, my sister did those things. She was two years older than me and she was tall. Like she went on to become six feet tall. And, you know, when you're, when you're a child and your older sister, you know, if you have older siblings, if they do something, you're going to like, my thing was like back off because my sister's six feet tall and like, she'll never compete. I'll (laughs) never compete. So I'm going to find a different sport. So I, she joined the track team, the cross country teams, and I did other sports, but, but I, that meant that I got to do running just as a private thing, as like a personal happiness that I did when I wanted to just go into my imagination. I would go running. I was a big reader, so I would read a lot, but I would, I would run or ride my bike and that motion unlock the creativity inside of me. Where was this? This was in New Jersey. 
so at a young age, you would say, I'm going to go out, I'm going to lace up and go out for a run? Yeah, but I mean, if back then a run was what, like running around the block. I like to pretend I was Harriet the Spy. She was my favorite, you know, heroine in a book. And I would run around the block, like looking for clues and making up stories. I would run through the Arboretum near our house in Summit. And so it was just a free, a, a, a running was a way to be free. And for me, it's still that way. So even though I've had all these successes in my life as a runner and, you know, winning Leadville in August, it's ultimately a form of creative expression for myself and a way to be free. And so in that way, it can't ever be so structured or goal oriented that mm -hmm. it takes away from that. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, do you take notes when you run? Yeah. Or how do you, cause I was going to say, how do you remember? I, uh, because I have moments of brilliant insight when I am running write and, them down and then they're gone <laughs> yeah so I've, I've had I've, my strategy has evolved over the years in the beginning you know when, when I was in my 20s and first started trail running in Santa Fe I would run up the same mountain every day and I would feel those ideas coming and I would try to keep them in my head they might be sentences in a story I was writing or just story ideas and they would stack up in my brain like planes on a runway so that by the end of a run and I would have to hold them there so I didn't forget and I would just I would try to remember them all in my head as I'm running and as new ones are coming and I would try to hold them in my mind and then as soon as I got back to my car at the trailhead I would like fling open the door and write them all down <laughs> before I forgot mm -hmm. well then I realized that I could carry so sometimes I would carry a note card and a pen in my jog bra mm -hmm. And I would stop because I don't have problems stopping when I run. Like, yes, I'll, I'm the same I'll way. I'll stop. I'll take pictures. I mean, it's about the process. It's about being present mm -hmm. for me. That's what running is. And it puts me in all my senses. And so then I would write them down on the note cards. And then I discovered notes on my phone. So I would type them in. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I was the last person in the world to discover voice memo <laughs> on my phone. So now occasionally I dictate in. Yeah. But um, so I keep track of them that way. And still some slip through the cracks. And I believe they come back to me if they're meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same issue. I, I started carrying around um, just a little tiny pen and a notebook. And then so what happened was I'd be running and I'd have to run into a little restaurant and say, can I, can I have a piece of paper? Yeah. You know, can so I you don't carry your phone. Usually I don't. I will on a really long run. I don't on shorter runs. And I do on the long runs mainly so I can take photos because mm -hmm. we've got this great, it's too bad. Next time you're yeah. up here, we can go running down on Alki. We've got this great beach run with oh, beautiful yeah. views. So I love to go down there on my long runs and do that. But then I'll take photos. Mm -hmm. but, um, but otherwise... I carry you know. my phone just for connectivity you know safety I had and I was attacked on the trail well can you talk about yeah. that you, since you've mentioned it um, I know there's a um, I, yeah, an excerpt in outside magazine um, from that chapter in the book in running home which actually is the first time I wrote about that incident pub publicly and it happened 10 years ago when my newborn my sec my older daughter Pippa was a newborn she was four months old and I had hiked throughout my pregnancy I didn't run in my pregnancy I stopped pretty early on just not because I don't think you should run during pregnancy. It just didn't feel, felt uncomfortable or like I'd eaten too much and like my pants were too tight or something. And so I felt just that bloated feeling. So I hiked and I hiked almost every day, um, which was fantastic just to experience the trails that way. And people would give me looks like, you know, when I was really pregnant, like straight up the mountain. And, but it was great. And, you know, when she came out, when she was born, no surprise, she liked to move too. Mm -hmm. So that the best way that I could put her to sleep was to hike. And so, uh, and she, the minute I put her in the carrier, she was out and she would sleep for two hours, you know, straight through. And it was fantastic because I could hike. The only problem was you I could not stop because if I even stopped to tie my shoe, she would stir and I would need to nurse her. And for some reason, nursing her on the trail was more intimidating to me than hiking with her on the trail. You know, and so we would hike up and down these mountains, but she was four months old and I was hiking this trail that I always hike. Although it wasn't my normal mountain, it was a, ta a trail slightly closer to town in Santa Fe and came around a corner and I saw a man that I'd seen many times before. I knew him to be homeless. I'd seen him, I recognized him and I felt because I recognized him, you know, your brain makes these calibrations that he was harmless. And, but we, you know, we got within five feet of each other and he had a rock behind his back, which I didn't see. And he threw it at me and it hit me above my temple. And then he started to chase me. And so I have my four month old daughter on my chest. And in that moment, you know, when he's coming toward me and I've been hit 
and I can't, I don't know if maybe she's been hit too. I just got to my feet and it was pure instinct, just screaming and running as fast as I could. And I realized in that moment that running could save my life and that I was fast and I could get away and that I had that as this defense. And so he was caught and- How far did you have to run in that instance? I just ran straight uphill. So off the trail, bushwhacking, you know, slapping branches. And and I was screaming and, you know, it didn't seem to come from me, the screaming, but it was me screaming. And um, some hikers heard me and came hurrying down and he had vanished. Um, And so they escorted me to the trailhead and where we called 911. And I, I was, we, Pippa and I were taken to the hospital and she was fine, you know, but the rock was bigger than her head. She, you know, it could have killed her. And actually like if it had hit at the wrong place in my temple, it could have killed me. And so he'd had a psychiatric break and, um, he was schizophrenic and anyway, he served, went to jail and has since been released. But for a period of time after that, I definitely wasn't hiking alone with her. Um, I would go with friends as extra eyes, but I had this moment where I just realized like I, it's, you know, it's a risk to go out with her, but it's, an even greater risk not to go, that I need wild places and not, you know, not just city streets. I think you can have a relationship with any, you know, landscape in which you live. If it's urban, if it's farm, if it's wilderness, I think it's so important to be outside in the world in which you live, to inhabit your world. And so I love walking around our neighborhood streets, but I really need that you know, being out in wild places in the mountains. How Coming from New Jersey, how did you find that? I think growing up with my father. So he had, you know, he lived in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. So we did more real nature with him. And then going to college in Vermont, I went to college at Middlebury, which has, um, you know, it's near the Adirondacks, the Green Mountains. And I, and that's where I really found my love of it. And then moving to New Mexico, I felt at home immediately. There's such a vast expanse, you know, you can see for so far. And it's, it's funny that I felt at home because it was so unlike New Jersey. I had moved from New York City. I had never set foot in the state. You know, I was going out to be an intern in Outside Magazine. I thought it might last three months. I hoped for six and, um, and 25 years, 25 later. <laughs> years later, but I, you know, it's dry, it's brown, it's dusty, it's crumbly. It's you, you brush up thing against things and they hurt. Like even the Adobe walls will scrape your skin. There was a harshness there, but it, there's also this intense softness. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so it's a creative art, artistic place. And I don't mean that in just that there's lots of galleries selling art. It's, it's a soulful place. It is. Yeah. And you can feel that. So, well, it's the light. Yeah. You know, so much of it is about the light, right? Right. I mean, the sky and it's the space. And I felt out in New Mexico when I moved there, I was 23, that anything was possible in that kind of space, that I could be whoever I wanted with all that space and all that, again, going back to that freedom. And so, you know, I had come from like you, New Jersey, you know, there was a certain path in life and, you know, most of it ended in New York City and you got your job. (laughs) And I did do that. I had my, you know, beige pumps and my coach briefcase and I walked to, you know, my publicity job at at a publishing house and that was great experience, but that was not who I was. But that, you know, so I broke out of that and... I think I surprised everyone by staying out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, I love going back to New Jersey, mainly, well, I have family there, but Mm -hmm. also like pizza. Yes. Um, Oh, thank you. I mean, (laughs) the thick crust, not the little part, but where it's like... You know, oh, an yeah, inch yeah, deep. Yeah. Oh, I love inch that. Inch wide or Yes, something? I love that. Oh my God. If I see people eat their eat their pizza and they leave their crust, Won't I'm like, you can take I, it? Can I, 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 oh yeah, can I have that? I oh, take yeah. the crust too. <laughs> I love it. Right off their plate. <laughs> yeah. But that never felt like home mm-hmm. for me. You know, it was just I never like I spent time in New York, but I just couldn't get into the big hair and the nails and, yeah. and that kind of thing. Just wasn't for me. And the it's just hair. so funny how you, we could be drawn to some place. Like I had never been to Seattle, but I knew before I even came here that I was going to move here because there was just something about it. You know, I had read something. I just knew that there was a draw. So same thing. And I told you before we started recording, Santa Fe would be my is yeah. my backup. You know, well, and I knew nothing choice. about it. I just, you know, I knew I wasn't happy in New York, and um, I knew Outside Magazine was in Santa Fe, and they had just relocated there from Chicago, and that they had an internship program. But beyond that, I knew nothing. I knew no one in the state, and um, yeah, it felt like home as soon as I got there, which was lucky. When you're 23, that's just luck. Yeah. 
Well, and did you meet your husband there? I did, and he's also from New Jersey. But of course, you would know in New Jersey, if they're not from the same town or at the same <laughs> school district, it's like a different state. Because yeah. everyone's like, did you, you know, you must have known him there. I'm, you know, no. <laughs> so we met in Santa Fe, and but we have that shared, you know, New Jersey um, yeah. thing. Well, I was going to say, I know it's difficult to find a match as a woman. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to find a match in yeah. in Santa Fe. So you you yes, lucked out. But I you did lucked out. Luck you, but out. you found somebody. You know, I did luck from, out, and he's very Jersey. outdoorsy, and he's an incredible athlete, very natural, like off the couch athlete. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we both love wild places, and so when we had our kids we, you know, made this decision right away or even before they were born that we would raise them in the places that we love most. So outside, so on river trips, in the back country, on, you know, we ski into huts. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll take them down rivers, wilderness rivers. And a lot of this is what I write in my column for outside. Raising but, rivers. Yeah, which is about how to bring up kids outside. But it's, you know, it's challenging in the beginning because when they're infant, you know, babies and you're in a in a tent and you're changing the diaper on the sandy tent floor, you know, that's, people are always saying, why would you do that? They don't remember, but we do as parents, like we're training ourselves to keep doing this. Cause it's so easy to, with kids to be like, that's way too hard. That's such a hassle. Yeah. But I think they, they may not remember the actual, they may not have an actual no, memory but it's in their muscle memory. It is. 100, and that's so much of what I write in the book is like uh, that our memories are not just our, in our mind, they're in our bodies. They're in the way we feel in a landscape. And, you know, I recall many early memories from childhood in my book that didn't live in my mind only when I began writing and really stayed with the writing did I feel like there's one scene where I'm chipping the paint on a railing on a black railing and the paint sort of curling up and I I hadn't remembered that and then when I revisited that scene that I wanted to write about I just remember peeling that away Mm -hmm. and you know memories live in our physical selves Mm -hmm. as much as our minds so your column is is about uh, raising rippers Mm -hmm. which is bringing up kids in the yeah. in uh, the wild. Yes. <laughs> basically. How old are your girls They're now? They're 8 and 10. 8 and 10. And how often would you say that you're out and about with them? I mean, are you out every, every day? Weekend? We're every, every day. I mean, we're out every day in some way. They walk to school, they bike to school, we're out, you know, and you know, taking hikes. They were doing something mm-hmm. outside every day. And for sure, every weekend we're in the summer, we're hiking. Um, and I'd say we do like a camping or longer trip once a month. Would you say that's unusual for Santa Fe? It's not unusual, um, but it takes a lot of effort. And there's a lot of times when you're like thinking about packing the, you know, the river bags for the fourth time and what gear and don't forget this or the rain jackets or let's pack. Let's And where's the teddy bear? Yeah. yeah <laughs> fortunately, we nip that early. Oh, like, those, they don't come because <laughs> we're, we just say like, you know, what if you, you want to keep yeah. them safe? So, yeah, yeah. but yeah, all the gear, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And so our general rule though, is if we're going out for more than a day that we go out for at least three nights. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the, the amount of prep is the same, but if you're only out for two nights, the amount of payoff right. being in the wild and camping and just getting that <sighs> decompress feeling, mm-hmm. it's, you know, hard to get in just two nights. So how do you manage your time getting out with your family and doing all the running that you're doing? Well, they're sort of symbiotic at some point. So I, my general sort of structure is that um, while my girls are at school, I will first do my run, um, which can vary from an hour to three hours. Um, So six to 20 miles or something? Yeah, exactly. And then um, when I'm in a build phase, you know, of my no non-training training, I have a longer day in there. But generally speaking, I'll do my run and then I come back. And once I've done my run, like my run is now in my body so it can help settle me to write. The running helps inform the writing. And that's how I wrote my book, Running Home, is it has that texture and that feeling of running because so much of it I did either while running or Mm -hmm. right after running. So then I come, you know, I do that. And then it's about time for my girls to get home. And so then I'm sort of in parent mode and will ride bikes or I'm, I coach the lacrosse team. So time on my feet is extra time. I count everything toward training. So walking the girls to school, which I love to do, coming home with them, cruising around town on our fat bikes, that's training. Any time on my feet or time on the move counts. And 
it's a nice liberal way because then it's like all of life is training, you know, like my life is my training plan. How much time then are you spending at the computer writing? I'm probably spending like three hours in the middle of the day and then usually like an hour to two hours at night. How are you, like, I'm, I'm super impressed. The reason I ask that question is that I'm super impressed with your structure, for one thing, because I'm, I'm often in training mode mm-hmm. and I run a business mm-hmm. and I'm in front of the stinking laptop a lot, like way more than I like. Mm-hmm. If I could throw that out the window, mm-hmm. right. I would be so happy. So I'm, uh, so the fact that you are spending like a dedicated amount of time here and a dedicated amount of time here, like that's brilliant. Well, it's not, um, <laughs> it's not like organized. And I have this part in my book where I write about how my friends are always like, how do you do it all? That and was my next question. So <laughs> and let how, me just how be, do you do it? And you're not exhausted. Well, I have a lot of energy. So I think that's, for, and I make sure I get sleep. So I'm seven and a half, eight hours a night kind of person. And how do I do it? It's, I'm not a perfectionist, thank goodness. So there's a lot of things I don't do that well. Like I don't cook very well. <laughs> uh-huh. um, my husband's right now rolling his eyes saying, I wish you would. But, you know, fortunately I have a very supportive partner um, and, he, you know, he, we're totally equal with childcare and um, he's probably a little bit more, ahead, mm. you know, does more in terms of cooking. And But I, my short answer is I don't do it all or I do a lot of it so-so and the things that I really care about writi- writing running Mm -hmm. and mothering, Mm -hmm. I try to do really well. But my style of mothering is also different. Like sometimes I think, well, why can't I do X or Y like other mothers? But what I do is we take them on river trips or we take them, I take them mountain biking after school. And so I think you just have to go to where your heart is and what your skills are and what makes you happy and not beat up about the other stuff. Because there's times where I'm like, well, why am I not making their Halloween costumes, right? (laughs) you know, but you just let things let, you know, I I have a really clear sense of what my values are. And if I'm indecisive about something or if I'm beating myself up, well, why can't I do that? Well, just to say, is that in the values? Because if it's not, then it's easier to let it go. Like, I wish I, you know, could sew costumes for Halloween. My mother did that, you know, and I, I remember fondly, but I'm also, you know, I'm also have my values are different. And so there's a lot of things and, and like a lot of things like in my book, I say I don't do it all. Like there's a lot I can't do or pull off and not, you know, not even close. Am I doing it all? Like I'm I'm the one like forgetting the, the carrots for snack at school. But we just kind of like we're all just kind of hanging on by our fingernails. And it's a different every day is different. So I don't have like you know, a set schedule. I'm, some people I'm sure do. But is that thrilling for you? Every day is different. No, it's sometimes really <laughs> hectic, but I know the pieces, right? Like I know the big pieces are running, writing and being a mom and being, you know, in my family. So with my husband and then, you know, the other pieces are sitting is really important. So meditating and um, then other things like I don't shop really, you know, I don't go out for drinks. I love, love, love movies. So I try to make time for that. And I have really good female movies friends. Movies out? Or yeah, just, okay. Both. But, you know, I don't, re- I rarely go to the movies, but I love them. Like, they feed me. Friendships are so important. So making time for friends is really important. So it's just, I know the pieces. I think it's just about self-awareness and knowing what really lifts you up and making time for that. And then the things that are extraneous or the things, you know, it's hard to say no to things or we find ourselves, you know, doing things that don't feed us. And I, I feel like that's part of the wisdom of, you know, I don't like the O word, but like getting older is realizing that you don't have to say yes to everything and, sh- you know, just do the things you it's love. It's wiser. Just getting wiser. Wiser. Just that's say, way yeah. better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's the perfect thing. Just getting wiser. Like, yeah. you know, and. Because it has nothing to do with age. It, it doesn't at all. But it's, you know, it's been running concurrent with my age that like all of a sudden when I turned 40, I was, I just felt like I didn't need to please anyone or, you know, that I was on my own path. And, um, so it's, it's easy. It's just making smart choices with your time. And I think being a mother forces you to do that because you can't, you can't do it all. You know, I used to love to play tennis, really avid tennis player. And after my girls were born, I knew that that wasn't up there in the top things and it was okay. I let it go. I don't, you know, if it were that important, if I missed it that much, I, I would 
take something else out of the equation. Mm -hmm. But now it's just this fondness I have for something that I used to do and love. And that you may go back to. And I may. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm, you know, really open. And I believe that, you know, if you just listen to your intuition, like you will know where to go. And so sure, tennis might come back. It's just not right now. Do you see yourself as a lifelong runner? I hope so. Because mm-hmm. I know, I mean, I, I know people who say, you know, I ho- I plan to continue running until I'm 80 or 90. I would love that. Mm-hmm. But I also, you know, listen to my body. And my biggest thing is I just want to stay in motion and like a physical being. Mm-hmm. And so many people are really disconnected from their bodies or s- live more stationary lives or indoor lives. And for me, I will always want that relationship to wild places and to my own physical self. So whatever form that takes, and hopefully it will be running because running is a great joy and freedom to me. Mm -hmm. And if it switches, you know, I'll be open to whatever that something else is, but I don't foresee that because I have been a runner all my life. And I think part of it is that I don't, I mean, the competition and the winning and the racing is like a a tiny part, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's fun to win, but Anytime I feel like I'm going too much in that direction of making that the reason I run, I, I, it's a practice of pulling myself takes back. takes the fun out of it. Yeah. Right? Or just, you know, it's fun to train for a race and it's fun to feel their progression in your body. And each week you're getting stronger and faster. And, but that's what it's about for me. It's about a confidence in an internal confidence and resilience that comes from the running, not just the running, you know, not just the racing or the winning. Mm-hmm. There are people, uh, as I said, I know people who say, I, you know, that they plan to run until they're 80 or 90. There are also people who, who look at me or who look at other runners and they say things about like how bad it is. Like oftentimes the first thing that's out of their, that comes out of their mouth is, oh yeah, it's like, isn't that hard on your body? And for a long time, because I'm relatively new to running, Mm -hmm. I only started really in my like 46 Mm -hmm. or something, right? 47. And, and I didn't really understand. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? You, because they're not runners mm-hmm. and, 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 and I'm just learning. So w- well, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. It's hard on your body. You know, and then they say, well, the knees yeah. or whatever. Like, what do you say to somebody? Yeah. I, I mean, you hear that a lot. You really do. And um, I think it's a story about running that isn't necessarily true or it might not be true for everyone. And um, so I... I actually just don't engage with that kind of conversation because um, I don't want to put energy toward something that I know internally has been a very beneficial thing for me, both my, you know, physiological self, my body and my psyche, my emotions. And so sure, there's lots of studies. My mom sends them to me, you know, like about your heart and... Oh, yeah. People die when they do, you know, and I just, um, I think there's a lot of unhealthy things out there and I don't think running is one of them. Right. I know. I had a friend who, um, who sent me a, uh, an article and it said, you know, uh, they found that, uh, you know, long distance running is, is bad for your heart Mm -hmm. or, you know, you can have heart attacks or whatever. And I was like, yes, so is sitting on the couch eating eating potato chips because that's, you know, because more people do that. I mean, it's not like there is a gradient, right? Like you can, there's a continuum. So you could be like out walking, you know, you're not, you might not be on the couch, but you might not be running. You might be walking. But I just think, I, I don't know. There's just, there's so much negativity, not so much because there's so much positivity around running. But, you know, I had an injury a couple of years ago and my physical therapist wanted to, while, while he was working on me and my bone had just been, you know, put back together with a plate and screws and I'm, you know, maybe a week out of surgery. And he was sitting, you know, working on me while telling me how bad running is for the knees. And I just had to stop in midstream. And I said, you know, you know, you can't, work on me and heal me with that mindset. And it never, like, he looked at me like he'd never thought of that, that like mindset is so important. Yeah. But you know what? Most people listening to this will think the same thing that it'll, that'll be an aha moment for them. Maybe that, oh, like really what I'm thinking about my body or what somebody else is thinking about my body who's working on me is going to, is going to affect it. I guess I just, you know, it was so clear to me in that moment because, you know, I was so vulnerable and I was so, an injury like that where, you know, the doctor tells me I should never run again. I broke my leg on a wilderness river trip and I needed surgery to fix my tibial plateau. And I was 14 weeks on crutches, non-weight bearing. And the orthopedist had told me, you know, very 
casually, like cavalierly, like if I were you, I'd never run again. And so I was really vulnerable. I mean, I had been win, you know, running ultras. I'd been winning. I was a writer for many years. I was writing a book. I was writing this book, Running Home. And, you know, he said, go find another hobby. And, you know, running was not my hobby. Like it was so much more. It was, a, <laughs> you know, a form of expression. So he, he was really kind of diminishing it, the, right. the value of and, it. Um, so when that kind of situation happens, when you're forced, like you're taken down to the studs almost, like I was on crutches, I couldn't run, I couldn't walk, you know, I was hobbling around the house, like talking about back before we were things, we stuffed down our jog bra, I would like, I had like a mason jar of coffee and I would shove it down my jog bra and hop around. So I was really like, just, I felt like I'd been scraped out and I was just like this raw putty. And so when I was on that physical therapist table and he said that, it was so clear like that I was so raw and in his words had power. And in that moment, I think I must've realized like, I don't want to let in any stories that aren't healing or serving me. And, you know, that was his story about his knees. He's like, oh, they're so bad for my knees. And, you know, and that may well be true for him. And, you know, he could maybe tell it to me another time, but like not while he was physically right. hands on. Yeah. His energy goes right into me. Right. Absolutely. I had um, a little niggling pain when I was training for a marathon last year and I happened to be in Santa Fe and I went to see uh, Dr. Robin Benson. Oh, Do you yes. know who, mm-hmm. Yeah. From Santa Fe Soul. She's been on the podcast oh, a okay. couple of times. And I went to see her. And, um, and I went to talk to her for the podcast and I mentioned my ankle and she said, oh, well, look, let's take a look and see what we could do to fix that up. And she gave me a couple of treatments, but her, like the fact that she like just lowered the bar and didn't look at my ankle and go, what the hell are you doing mm-hmm. running on that? She was just like, let's just see mm-hmm. about fixing this up. And then I came back and I went to my chiropractor here in West Seattle and, um, had him do a, a little bit of work, some laser therapy on it. And it was the same thing. His response was so low key that I just think like it just made me, it just gave me, gave me so much confidence. That it made you every, probably more receptive to the healing. Yes, exactly. Just made me think that everything was going to be okay. But if somebody had said something like what your mm-hmm. PT or your doctor had mm-hmm. said, like, oh, you should never run again, then you know, your body's going, well, you're not not, right. You're not in a mindset for healing. And I think, I think that people are starting to understand that. And certainly in the medical field, I think they're really seeing the link between the healing, our body's healing and our mind, you know, and that powerful, powerful connection. And for me, it was really clear. Like, you know, when I was recovering, I didn't call it my broken leg. You know, the minute I got surgery, it was my healing leg. I'm on the progression forward. Mm -hmm. And um, just little things. I, I, you know, my body told me what it needed. I sat outside a lot in the sun. It needed that vitamin D and that fresh air. And so our bodies are really wise if we, if we listen. And if we listen to the, you know, the stories our bodies are telling us not you know, which isn't a discount. I think, you know, obviously Western medicine is yeah, huge. I mean, he, he did an impeccable job on my knee. I, you know, I won the Leadville 100 last year with his plate in my knee. <laughs> but um, I think that there's big areas of opportunity around our minds and the connection between our minds and bodies. Did you ever go back and show him your medal? <laughs> no, but I have friends your of buckle. mine who are, do- exactly, friends of mine who are doctors have relayed my successes to him. Good. Well, you know what, Let's talk about Leadville Mm -hmm. 100 and explain for listeners what that is and, uh, and your accomplishment there. So, so that's, um, a hundred mile race in Colorado, in Leadville, Colorado. That's, um, one of the most prestigious ultra marathons in the country. And, um, it goes up to elevations of 12,600 feet and very difficult to get into to begin with. It's a lottery. Yes. It's so it's, it's just a random lottery. Yeah. It's a crapshoot. You put your name in and. Anyway, I um, had put my name in the lottery. I had come, you know, I I guess I'd started running exactly a year before. So in 20, um, whatever that was, end of 2016, uh, the last day of 2016. Running after your injury. Right. Last day of 2016, I went out for my first run. And I wanted, you know, the new year is always very symbolic to me. And I I wanted to go out on the last day of the year, not the first day Mm -hmm. of the new year. And so I went, and so I began, you know, 
I, I built up very slowly, conservatively with the doctor's voice in my knee, you know, echoing like, <laughs> you know, sinister voice. And, and then in, you know, nine months later, I did a trail marathon and I set the course record and won that overall. And I did a 50K and a 50 mile that I won and 100K. And anyway, so you and were just working your way working up. Working my way up. And did you know you were working your way up? Yeah. Or? I mean, at that point, I think um, I put my name in the law. Lo- I did the trail marathon and they put my name in the lottery. And but I'd had this moment earlier, like when I was just beginning back after my injury, um, where I had this run. And I think I think this is a really big po- point of how I of my success as a runner, but where I was just running up the trail, sh- my little mountain, but you know, it's not very far. And I thought if I can run an ultra distance again, it just to finish will be incredible. And so it was like that mix of gratitude and humility um, is sort of like my secret sauce, mm-hmm. <laughs> probably many other people's too. But um, so I had that moment and, and, you know, many months later, it just, that goes into your muscle memory, right? Like your, your psyche. And a few months later, I put my name in for the hat and, you know, maybe like six or seven months later, heard I got into Leadville. And then there's that feeling of like, yes. Oh, shit. And also like, (laughs) oh, shit. And then I was on a more clear progression. Like I, you know, I had certain training benchmarks. Like I ran a 50K on my own that my friend and I do every year right around Easter. It follows this sort of pilgrimage route in New Mexico. To Chimayo? To Chimayo. Oh, gosh. Yeah, and wow. we have this like sort of... Is that of, a road race to, no, to Chimayo? No, and we don't run on the road. We oh. run out to the river, to the um, through Diablo Canyon to the Rio Grande, and then back, we cut, cut cross country on the roads. So it's our own little thing. Oh, it is, okay. And um, we just do it. She does it for her reasons, and I do it for mine, And but we always come together. And um, and so I did that. As, that really was a 50K, and then I did a 50 mile. So I, need, I knew I needed a 50 mile and a 100K, and I needed some high elevation things, which I can get it at Santa Fe, out my door. We mm-hmm. go, you know, our mountains go to 12, sure. six. And so I knew I was on the progression. And, um, but for me, it was always that feeling. It was really that feeling of like, if I can just finish, I, I you know, that'll be amazing. And so I knew I was strong and I was running well. And I, most of all, I was running happy, which is when I run happy, I run strong and run healthy. And, you know, I'm not getting caught up in my time or, I wasn't thinking about winning Leadville. You know, I was thinking about each day and how happy I was to be running and how grateful, like after all I'd been through. And that was really my mindset going into Leadville. Like I was dry, you know, even when I showed up there um, in August, four or five, you know, three or four days before the race, I pulled into town. And before I got to town, I had to pull over because I was so overcome to see the mountains and to realize my journey there. And that I just, in that moment, I realized that whatever happened at the race was like icing on the cake, was the cherry on top, that I could even be there healthy, towing the line with a healthy body and my first hundred mile race, because that was my first at that distance. Like it was just all good. And so that really, that's that mindset when you let go of wanting to win or trying for the end result. It's a very Zen thing. And I write about that a lot in my book, not about Leadville, but uh, because that actually happens in the, you know, after this book ends, but that feeling of not doing it for the results, but doing it for the moments leading up, you know, for being present to the moments as they happen or to the training. And it's not to say you're passive and just letting life happen to you. You can be very intentional, but you're intentional on the process, not the result. And that, so, uh, you know, I knew the night before Leadville in my notebook, because I keep notebooks, I guess people would call them journals, but I just call them my notebooks. I wrote, I'm ready. And I just felt that way. Like I felt, actually, what did I write? No, it, um, it's my time. And I didn't know what that meant. I just felt that. And so um, it really was. I had this, you know, just day where everything connected literally all the parts of my life runner writer mother my children were there you know I had the kind of day where your feet don't touch the ground it feels like and I won you know I was the first female by 90 minutes and I placed that's a that's yeah and I placed 11th overall in a field of 800 wow so it was just this incredible convergence Mm -hmm. That you you really feel like you're aligned in your life, like when something like that. I mean, of course, I'd done the work, and that's a lot of miles and a lot of like my training strategy for Leadville, as I said, was that everything counts, 
run when I'm uncomfortable. So I would go out at odd times of the day, like when I would wish I could just be writing or reading or eating or, or sleeping. sleeping. <laughs> right. And I would eat a big meal beforehand or something kind of I knew that wouldn't be great on my stomach. And then I would go run. Mm. So just, condi- just to get, yeah, just conditioning to get myself to to, so that I was used to being uncomfortable. Because mm-hmm. that's a lot of what 100 miles is, is just staying with it. And it's so mental. Yeah, you you mentioned Zen. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, a sitting practice, mm-hmm. a meditation practice. Percentage wise, how much influence do you think that that has on your distance running? Increasingly, more and more influence for sure. I would say, like when I was first getting into distance running, which we really haven't talked about, but it was in 2010 after my father died and he had kidney cancer and he died very quickly. And my second daughter had just been born, and I was in that sort of postpartum grief, sleep deprivation, PTSD because it had happened so quickly. You know, kind of like almost a fugue state where I was just so out of it. I I mean, you are out of it after childbirth period, but then when you throw in grief. And so um, that's when I began running long distances just as a way to feel better and to move out of my worried mind. Because I thought my, my grief manifested as anxiety that I was afraid I was dying too. And so initially I, I, I began meditating then very intermittently just sort of as a way to find relief from the anxiety and it was scattered I took some meditation you know courses here and there what was really instrumental was I met my friend Natalie Goldberg who is an incredible Zen teacher and writer and she's at the Upaya Mm -hmm. Zen Center yeah well she lives down the street but she Mm -hmm. teaches there and she's written 15 books one of which is writing down the bones which is just a seminal book on writing and what she calls writing practice, um, sort of as a way to tap into your, your deeper thoughts beyond what's in your discursive brain. And, um, so I met Nat by chance, just as like so many friendships like that start, you know, we, I was on the trail and I had my second daughter, Maisie was like two or three weeks old in my carrier. And I had begun hiking again with her alone. And, I saw Nat and the trail and I, I recognized her because, she, you know, she's quite well known and she just looked, she was going one way and I was going up and she just did a double take and she said like, is, is that a baby in there? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, is she suffocating? <laughs> you know, and I lifted up the flat, but I said, I don't think so. I think she's just sleeping, you know, because she, like my older daughter, Pippa, like, you know, she'd hiked all through pregnancy in utero. And so anyway, I'm that I, I knew Nat then, or I, I met her, but we didn't have any exchange. But I'd been wanting to sign up for one of her courses and um, been on the fence because I had a newborn. How can I do that when I'm breastfeeding and have a toddler? And like, how am I going to juggle that? And as soon as I saw her, I was like, that's my sign. So I went home and I signed up for that class. And so that really began our friendship. And she, in the book, is this sort of like wise sage, like slash Yoda voice kind of chiming in with this wisdom that is really completely authentically who she is she has this deep deep zen outlook and she would say things to me so you know when I met her actually the day that her course started um, that I had signed up for was the day I found out my dad was dying of cancer so just in terms of those very serendipitous timings or just life just kind of aligning in weird ways and after that after that retreat, we became friends and started hiking. And so she would, we talked about death and dying and grief, but we also talked about cooking because she was, you know, she knew I didn't know how to, (laughs) so she'd tell me how to roast a chicken. She'd be like, this is how you do it, you know, and like, you know, put the olive oil. So we just had this deep friendship and she would share some of her deep wisdom, but not in a way of like, let me sit you down and like impart yeah, this yeah. like wisdom, but it would just, it just come out. What we yeah. would do is we would hike. And so mm-hmm. we hiked once a week up our mountain and down the mountain. We had this, our protocol that we decided was our rule forever and that all people should follow. <laughs> not really, but um, we would hike up in silence at our own paces because we had different paces. And I, I was carrying Maisie who was, you know, like three or four months old. And then 
she would stop on a rock midway up and meditate and I would go to the summit and then on the way down, I would pick her up and then on the way down, we were allowed to talk. Mm. So we sort of had like... Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, we had sort of put our mindfulness in our bodies and then we, when we came together, we always ha- went right to sort of the heart of things. And so we ha- would have these amazing conversations and, you know, in the book, I'm dealing with the grief of my father and, you know, at one point she said, you're so full right now you know, you're so alive, you're so full. And this is when I was thinking I was dying. And mm. I would tell Nat, like, I'm pretty sure I have this this week. So you know? full, meaning full of grief. Full, full, well, full just, of everything. Yeah, full of, like, because you were feeling the grief. Yeah, and she's like, you're so alive. Mm. And that's a, you know, that's a very Zen thing, like good and bad. You're in the grief and it, there's joy too. And like, you're so full of everything. And I think in our culture, we see things as so black and white or it's this or that. You know, Mm -hmm. and Nat showed me that it was really both and like you can have both things at once. You can be, you know, so alive and so afraid you're dying. You know, and that really translated to helping me understand about my father. Like he was such a kindred spirit, you know, as he was a National Geographic photographer and he really taught me how to see the world and to pay attention, to be a good observer and um, to to really it was kind of mindfulness that he would never have called it that that was you know not in vogue mm-hmm. but that he taught me how to see the world but at the same time he had made choices in our life and in our family you know that were in conflict with being a good father because and he was traveling just well, yeah I'll let people readers come to that on their own in the book but that you know those two things don't con- you know they they're contradictory but they can both be true at the same time. And that is really what Zen is, is like no dualities, no good, no bad. And when I would sit, it just is, I could exactly, it just is. And when I could sit, I could hold that. And so I, this is a very long winded way of saying like, I, I learned more about that by being friends with Natalie. And I started sitting a little bit. I mean, my stamina for sitting is like nothing compared to what I can run, you know, like maybe eight or 10 minutes. But that's also a story I tell myself because I'm sure I could sit for an hour if I put my mind to it. So when you said before that uh, when I I asked the question, like like the percentage of how much of an influence it is or how much it helps you in terms of your long distance running, and you said increasingly Mm -hmm. more so, did you mean that increasingly more so because you are meditating more or increasingly more so because whatever the eight minutes that you're doing on a daily basis is having more influence on you when you go and run? I'm meditating more and I don't mean more in duration, but I mean more frequently. Um, like I'm, I'm making it more of a daily, I've made it more of a daily practice. So initially after my father died and I was just learning about it in those first few years, like it was, I would take a class, but then I wouldn't have a, my own practice. Now I have my own practice and I can still go a week or so without doing it as I have right now. Cause I'm on book tour, but it's more, it's a practice that I have. And so, and as I practice it, I'm also learning more, you know, and I'm, I'm understanding more how, that kind of mindset of holding both and letting all possibilities exist is so important in life. And, and, and so, yeah, it's just that I'm exploring it more deeply. And, and certainly that had so much to do with my injury when my leg was broken and I couldn't run. I I did. I mean, I think that's really when I developed my sitting practice. Mm -hmm. So you were meditating more at that point? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that was really, and that was a coping mechanism for sure during that time when, everything was, you know, upside down when I didn't know if I could run again, or it was a way to um, just ground myself in what is like, what was right in front of me, this, like, it doesn't feel good. It feels like I've just been like scraped down to nothing, but it is this, like, this is, you know, there's a Zen saying, just, this is it. Like, just, this is it. This is where I am. Mm -hmm. Neither good nor bad. No good, no bad. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before that you have, you don't call it a journal, but you call it a notebook. notebook. Yeah. So do you keep in your notebook, like separate from your writing, like for outside Mm -hmm. magazine and separate from book writing, Mm -hmm. do you keep it personal thoughts? Is that what your notebook is? Yeah, my notebook is everything. Like it's, it's sort of, if I'm working on a pro, like if I'm wrestling with something in my personal life, like I'll write, I'll write it out. But if I'm stuck, you know, I don't do my outside writing there. Um, But if I'm stuck on a section in my book, for example, I, my freehand write. I might do writing practice about it. Like, well, what am I trying? A good, a good writing practice prompt if I'm stuck on something is like, what I'm really trying to say is, 
mm-hmm. you know, and you just write and, and that practice of writing is like no self editing, like keep your pen moving, don't cross out, just keep writing. And eventually you'll get to like the truth of that. And so, but I'll also write down, like if I overhear conversations or if I see something interesting, like today, I mean, this sounds so silly, but like on the way up here, like a Chrysler LeBaron with like a, a bumper, like half dragging on the ground, pa- <laughs> you know, was driving in the slowly. I mean, the fast lane, super slowly. <laughs> and I was like, that's a moment, you know, like I, that I will write down or, you know, so it's just, it's observations, big time observations. It's snippets of conversation it's story ideas have it's everything and and I bring a, I bring I always have my notebook with me so it might even be outside magazine stuff if I'm like on a river trip and I don't have my computer it's going in my notebook mm-hmm. so yeah. I always have one mm-hmm. it's sort of it's just it's just always it goes everywhere with me hey to get back to the running stuff because I want to know for personal reasons I'm really curious just logistically how you handle recovery, nutrition, mm-hmm. managing injuries mm-hmm. or little nigglings. Like what, what do you do? What do, do you have a special diet that you follow? Um, I try not to eat gluten because I do find that, you know, creates inflammation and a little soreness, um, you know, just in my joints. I notice I don't really do dairy. It's not, doesn't agree with me, but I love pizza. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so not that's Santa Fe pizza. No. Okay. No. no. It's like East coast. Pizza. No, the, but even just talking about it, like I could really go for a piece of pizza right now. Mm. So anyway, but in a, as a general rule in my general life, I would not be doing dairy. I don't really drink like maybe a glass of wine once or twice a week. Um, those are my main things. And then I just try to eat as healthily like vegetables. I do need quite a bit of protein. I just find like I run, my body runs on fat and protein better than carbs. You so, eat meat, red mm-hmm, meat? I do. Mm-hmm. So the night before a race, my, my go-to meal before every race or long effort, I shouldn't just say race, but like before any long effort is a hamburger, no bun, or maybe like a buffalo burger, sweet potatoes, and a big salad. Mm. So it's just about getting calories in for me. I mean, not just calories, but I need a lot of calories before something like that. So that's really my nutrition. I mean, what else? I um, Do you do anything post- Post, Post run. well, I do drink a recovery drink made by Goo, which is my sponsor, and um, it's got like the perfect blend of protein and carbs. And um, so I'll just mix it. I bring a water bottle wherever I, you know, after my run, and I'll mix it in with almond milk or water. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, what was your other question? Recovery? Yeah, just uh, recovery, managing your Inju- injuries yeah. and any kind of nutrition well, stuff. So I do strength training twice a week. And that I think is really big for injury prevention. Do you run on those days? Yep. Yep. I do. I run like shorter. Like I might do, I might run up my mountain, which is distance wise, not that short, but it's a good, you know, strength training and cardio up going up. And then I'll do an hour in the gym. And um, so strength training, I think is my biggest injury prevention. Another one is I have a home yoga practice, which is, you know, 15 minutes, just this little sequence of postures that I cobbled together years ago mm-hmm. and a um, couple times a week couple two three I mean ideally I would be doing like three or four it's mm-hmm. like only 15 minutes and but I I think yoga is great but I have a really hard time going to a yoga class because I want to be outside so I mo- like I'll find when the weather turns nicer in Santa Fe which is just starting to like if I can do my yoga outside on the in the back patio like I'm so happy so I'll so I'll do yoga I do try to get on my foam roller. I just tried one of those amazing gadgets. I think it's like the R8 or something. It um, goes over your leg and it's just crazy on your IT bands, mm-hmm. which I really want to pick up one of those. Mm-hmm. I do do Pilates, but not on the machines. I just have a home practice. And that, I think core strength is so important for trail running and balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, you know, they say every injury has a silver lining. That was certainly a silver lining of the injury before my broken leg, I actually broke my kneecap. And yeah, that was um, just a freak avulsion fracture when your muscle flexes, you know, contract so hard that like it breaks your own bone. And um, so from that was not a That's how it broke? Yeah, I was just running and I didn't fall and it was just like 
the See, thing. running is so bad for you. You shouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm know. telling you. All right. You're right. I'm sold. Okay. I've changed my mind. Yeah. No. Um, but that was, you know, for eight weeks, it was only eight. Now I'm saying it's only eight weeks, Yeah. you know, but I was, I was weight bearing because I'd been walking around on it. My doctor was like, what, you know, you've been walking around on this thing. And, but I did develop Pilates. Like I did a Pilates routine and, you know, I, almost nothing makes me feel stronger in conjunction with my running than doing that like four times a week. And it's 15 minutes, you know, you do, I do mm-hmm. it before I go to bed. Mm-hmm. It's such a good point that you say, because you, you have little segments that yeah. you're doing. You're doing yoga yeah. for 15 minutes. You're doing short Pilates. You're doing these workouts. And I think a lot of people think that to find benefit, they've got to Mm-mm. like, they have to go to an hour and a half long yoga set yoga and I can't go to yoga myself yeah. because it drives me bonkers no, to sit for an hour and 15 minutes an hour I know. and a I half I wish they didn't invent the 40 minute class <laughs> yeah I know there's anyone a, out there do the 40 minute class I'm there you but. know what there's P90X thir- uh-huh. P90X3 do you know P90X mm-hmm. the, um, they have a P90X3 which is a 30 minute program and they've got a yoga session that's 30 minutes which is like for me it's like golden yeah, that's gold. it's, and it's mm-hmm. it's tough too it's a tough one yeah no I think I believe in like I mean it's fine it, that's part of what it, why it's so creative to be you know an endurance athlete is you have to be creative with your time especially if you have children or any kind of other big commitment and so yeah to find those little pockets they exist you can find them like I I mean like I was saying before I do squats up on top of the mountain I'll just do 50 I'll even turn like I do box you know what do they call them box jumps I just what mm-hmm. I call them rock jumps mm-hmm. I'll find a flat rock I'm, when I'm on top of my mountain I just I'll just do them and I did that the other day in Boulder just going up the mountain so there's so many windows I mean you know Dean Carnassus, the ultra runner who I interviewed and sort of had a, a big effect on the course of my life when I did this story where I, I ran with him and I just ran, I ran a marathon in the course of interviewing him, not intending to, you know, I, I was intending to interview him, but I, I just um, was interviewing him while we ran. And before I knew it, we'd run a marathon, <laughs> but he, you know, he was telling me how he would just do push ups Like right now he'd be doing like 10 push ups mm-hmm. and I'll do, I'll do that. And so it, and it's not like a compulsion. It's just a for, it's just being creative with your time. Mm-hmm. And also it's so much, be- you know, our bodies need that. Yeah. They've, there are studies on how sitting for prolonged periods of time. Mm-hmm. I always make sure as I'm waiting for the tea kettle to warm up, to boil my tea, that I'm stretching, you know, yeah. that I'm bent over, that I'm, you know, doing calf stretches. Yeah, and, that and I don't kind even think you have to think. I mean, some of it you have to think about, but some of it's just like, listen to what your body's saying. And like, for me, just doing 15 minutes of Pilates a few nights before bed is kind of that nice transition time between often I'm working at night writing or on my computer. And then you need to get out of your head and back into your body. Um, and so it's, it's good. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's just getting into a habit. Uh, it is. As well. It's so hot. Mm-hmm. And then once you're in it, it's, you feel, you don't like to, I don't like to break it. It feels, it, I, well, then it, it feels, feels so good. Yeah. Then, then you can feel when you don't do it. Right. That's the whole thing. When you say listening to yourself, it reminds me of just having, uh, like the intuition. Yes. You just, you just kind of go by your gut because you've mentioned it. Several I go times. by my gut. Yeah. And, and that was really sort of after my dad died. And I write about this in running home. Like there wasn't, you know, in some ways it made sense that I would start running longer and longer distances because I'd always been a runner. I mean, I, I did that first race, as I mentioned, when I was seven. Um, but in some ways it made no sense because I was so afraid of dying and, you know, to go out into these remote areas alone, like, you know, that's running right into your fear. But it was that intuitive voice inside that says, like, I think this will help, you know, because I tried many things. I, you know, I live in Santa Fe. There's many alternative therapies and I'm a very open person. So I tried a lot (laughs) and some of them worked, some of them didn't, some of them worked better, but, um, that, that voice inside was like, you know, running, running and being outside in nature. And it really worked. I mean, it was what I needed, but I don't think, I think we forget about that voice. You know, we, we get so in our to-do lists or our like shoulds or, you know, our comparisons that we, lose track of that voice. And it's always in us. You just have to get a little quiet sometimes, slow down. I don't even mean sitting, like you, you can get to it other ways, but it's, you know, it's, it's there and it has stuff to teach us. You just have to pay attention. You're right. Being cognizant of the time. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to still chat about? I mean, I feel like we've done a really good job. We've talked about 
the book and about anxiety and about meditation, which was great, and mindfulness, running and training, mm -hmm. balancing parenthood. I mean, I feel like you nailed it. We covered everything. Yeah, is there I know that we could go on for another yeah, two hours. Yeah, is there hours? anything burning you want to ask me? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, you know what? There is something that is burning. So you work at Outside Magazine, which is a, I'm guessing, it's a male-dominated environment. Okay, I work for them. So, right. I mean, I, I, don't, I used to work on staff. I was on staff for 12 years, and now I'm freelance, so I work from home. Okay, but still, it's still a male-dominated, primarily male-dominated yes. environment. The running world is predominantly male. I mean, there's lots of women. Yeah, I think both outside and ultra running. And I don't have the stats on both or either, but I would say they lean more male. Yeah. You know, I think I don't, I, I can't say that outside is male dominated anymore. Certainly while I was there, it was, you know, while I was on staff. But ultra running, yes, there's more men running than women. And you're comfortable in that environment. Yeah. I mean, I was really raised in that environment. I think I've worked it outside for so long and, you know, it but was raised. You had a, you, you, you're, oh, is it your only sibling as a sister? My sister. Yeah. I have a stepbrother and a stepsister too. Okay. I mean, I just say it like as a professional, like I have always worked in a place that, you know, what leaned male. And I think growing up, I, yeah, I was a tomboy. I don't know if that makes any difference, but like I was always tough and I wanted to show that I was tough. And um, I think maybe it has to do with being the youngest. I was the youngest of two. And then, you know, when my, my mom remarried, when I was just six, we became four kids. So I was the youngest of four in my family. And, you know, it's just about being scrappy and keeping up. <laughs> I think more than like male or female, it was just, I was all, you know, I would keep up and I don't quit and I just keep going. And that's kind of the, uh, that comes from both sides. I mean, that's really, my mom is such a, such an opt, radical optimist and, you know, just, just keep going, you know, like, and, and that's kind of, if I could sum up the book of running home, you know, in two words, it's keep going. It's funny. You use very similar words, uh, about yourself that I do mm -hmm. like from New Jersey youngest, although I had three brothers mm -hmm. and tomboy, yeah. but I always thought my tomboy came because I was in, you know, that I had three brothers. Yeah, no, you know? it's probably just like, for me, it was just, I like to play outside. I'm very physical. I think it's a, ba a way of being in the world. I'm a physical person and I always like to be in motion, which isn't to say like, I don't, I can't curl up on the couch and read a book. Like I've been an avid reader since I was a child. So I had both sides, but, you know, being uh, a physical person was so important and so defining to me. And I, I, I thought that was how everyone was, but you realize, no, mm -hmm. like there's many who aren't. And I took a meditation class earlier uh, or late last year that was sort of about flow and, and finding your flow state. And, and one of the first questions was like, are you in touch with your body? Like how it feels? And, you know, my hand went up like, yes, sometimes too much. I mean, that's the trouble I ran into that I write about in Running Home, which I was so aware of every sensation that it became anxiety. But many people in the room, I would say vast majority of people in the room did not raise their hands. So we're not in touch with their physical selves. Hmm. And that's just, I feel like a commentary kind of on our culture right now is that we've lost that connection to our strength, our physical strength, but our physical strength is also you know, a window into our emotional strength. And when you build physical strength, like you're building emotional stamina. So there's just these parts of our, of us that are being cut off and to our detriment. I think that's why anxiety and depression are on the rise, you know, and, and that's why, you know, my book is about running, but I don't believe that anyone has to be a runner to feel the benefits. I mean, just go walk through your neighborhood, like develop a relationship with both your environment and your physical self and the disconnection to both is what I think, you know, is ailing so many of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, um, I just got back from two big trips. I was in India for three weeks mm. and then a week home. And then I was in Morocco wow. for two weeks. And on both of those trips, I was very aware of a lot of sensations, like how food was affecting mm. me and how jet lag was affecting me and sleep and, probably, and sleep yeah. and lack of sleep. And I, and as I was going through this process, I thought, my gosh, am I just, am I getting, I've been traveling for 30 years and I thought, am I getting like out of, am I getting cushy one thing? Like, for, am I getting too cushy in terms of my travel and I need certain things with me? Cause I travel with like protein mm -hmm. powders and, you know, right. supplements and all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, am I just getting out of rhythm? 
And then I, I just realized I do a lot of journaling myself. And through days and days of journaling just this past week, I realized, no, you're just more in tune. I was just going to say, your no, you're just more self-aware. Yes, than I've ever been. You know been. what you need. It's yeah. Really interesting. Really interesting epiphany for me. And I think that's that, that goes to my meditation practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm on a... I'm on a streak of like, I don't know, 230 days or Whoa. something that I've got, you know, that I, that every day I've done at least some meditation. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this is all, that's what's going on. Like, I, I'm just getting to know myself better and being more aware of it. And, and that's kind of cool. And knowing what you need. Yeah. And I think that's what running has done for me, you know, and increasingly meditation, but like, it teaches you how to take care of yourself like out on the trail for hours at a time, like, you know, I, I know what I need. And sometimes I get lazy because I'll like, we didn't talk about this, like what I, how do I care for myself on the trail, but I need to eat twice. I need to eat about 200 calories an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I'll get lazy or just, yeah, offhand about it. Or if it's just a training run or, uh, and I won't do that. Or like, this is classic, like when you're on your way home, whenever you, if you get to your farthest point, whenever I flip it, I always think I'm running home, which is part of the why the book is called that. But, you know, on the way home, it's easy to be like, I don't need to eat. I'll be back at my car soon, you know, and. But you need but it. But you need it. Mm -hmm. And so running has taught me how to take care of myself, both on the trail and off, like how to ask for help. You need a lot of help running ultras and, um whether it's friends dropping food at like trailheads yeah, you need or, your crew. you know, you need your crew. And, um, and so it's easy to think we're so independent and I, I have a very independent streak and that's sort of tough streak we were talking about of like, I'll just get it done and I can take care of myself. Um, so ultra running has taught me that it's really, it's help is necessary, but at the same time, and I write about this too, like, you know, with all the help and all the people who show up for you, like you're still the only one who can get yourself across the finish line. Mm-hmm. And so there's that both and again, you know, both are true. Mm -hmm. You and your mind. Together. You and your mind and you and your crew. And like you can belong and you can be separate and you can be strong and you can be vulnerable, you know, and you can be afraid a lot and you can be courageous at the same exact time. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm still like, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm afraid all the time on the trail, but I think about it. I don't ever go out and not think about my safety after, you know, what happened. Right, sure. But, um, I think that's courage is to like, uh, is to f acknowledge your fear and, and move through it into it and not run in the opposite direction. That's a beautiful, beautiful place to end it. Um, I always ask guests at the end, what does it mean to you to be bold? Do you think that you're bold? I think I'm bold. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you don't shy away from no, that. No, I think too. I'm definitely bold, but, um, you know, for me being bold is keeping going when you don't feel like it or when you're scared. Or, you know, when you're not sure why you're doing it, but listening to that voice inside. And it's just, it's finding out what you're capable of, which is always more than we think. Um, and it's, and it's living life to the fullest. You know, I had this moment when my dad, after my dad died, where I realized we are going to die, all of us. But first I want to live. Uh, where can people find your book? Where can they find you? Yeah, that's great. You can find Running Home at any any bookstore. Any I really support independent bookstores. So go to your local shop and ask for Running Home or you can get it on Amazon or randomhouse.com. It's also available as an audio book, which I read. Fun. Which I narrated, which was really fun. And let's see, I'm on Instagram as Katie, at Katie Arnold. And on Facebook as Katie Arnold, author, athlete. Awesome. And, and I'll link to all those in the show great. notes Great. And too. Twitter is at Raising Rippers. And you can also find me on www.katiearnold.net. And you're at Outside Online yes. or Outside Magazine exactly. as well. Yeah, all your articles. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Katie, thanks so much for making time Thank and for you. coming up here. Thank you so and, uh, much for having me. It's, it's been a real pleasure. You, I don't know if you got to enjoy Seattle, but we, had, we did have four seasons in one day mm -hmm. today. We had hail. We had oh, beautiful sunshine. I saw the sun. Yeah, we had rain and, and I ran in the rain mm -hmm. this morning. You know, you said on the phone to me when we were chatting before, you said, I don't let any anything stop me like yeah. I go out in all weather mm -hmm. and when I looked out the door this morning and it was raining I'm like I'm gonna pull a yeah. Katie I'm gonna just put, yeah. a, put on my raincoat no. and I'm I gonna mean, go I mean you run. meet the elements that's yeah. another thing is that so many of us sort of like shy away from that and like, like just live in the world like in my you know Natalie my friend calls it inhabit your life moment by moment oh it's raining I'm you know like I'm just gonna be in the rain but I I love the rain because I never get it so <laughs> I ran in it yesterday and just was like loving yeah. it yeah we get it all the time. Yeah. 
Well, thanks again. Thank Appreciate you. It. She is really inspirational to me in terms of how she is so focused on certain things and how she is willing to admit that some things just aren't a priority. I think that sometimes, as women especially, we feel like we have to do everything. And she just recognizes that that's not possible and that it's also okay. Please pick up a copy of Katie's book, Running Home. You can find out more about Katie at katiearnold.net. She's at Katie Arnold on Instagram, and she's Katie Arnold Author Athlete on Facebook. And don't forget to check out her Raising Rippers column at Outside Magazine. For these links and for links to all the things we chatted about in this episode, go to she'sboldpodcast.com slash episodes, and there you will find the show notes for this and all of my other conversations. You can also find those links and show notes in whatever podcast app it is you're using to listen to this. Don't forget to check out my Patreon page. It's basically a way for you to say, yes, I like what I'm hearing on the She's Bold podcast, and I'm willing to support the show and get some special bonus content. When you become a Patreon, you unlock that content. And as I mentioned, it's questions that I ask guests after we complete an episode, and those are really fun to listen to. You can find out more by going to she'sboldpodcast.com slash Patreon. You can connect with me by friending me on Facebook, and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. That Instagram account is where you'll see my travel photos, and I've just started another Instagram account at Beth Witwa, B-E-T-H-W-H-I-T-W-A, and that's where you'll see more personal posts such as images of me in my travels, with me running, and with podcast guests. Ladies, you can join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group for support and and encouragement for whatever ways you're trying to be bold. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the She's Bold podcast. Until next time, be bold.